Some of the wisest people in the world are really dumb, and I mean D-U-M dumb. Hi, I'm David Servant. This is Heavenward TV. Thanks so much for joining me. Nice to have you back as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And we're going to dive back into the middle of Matthew chapter 11 today. This is a fascinating chapter. The, the overriding theme, not the entire theme, but the largest theme here is Jesus' lamentation uh, for the the people's rejection of John the Baptist as well as himself. And of course, a rejection of Jesus and a rejection of John the Baptist is a rejection of God. It's a rejection of the message that they came to bring. Both of them preached repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so uh, we're, we're going to begin today in Matthew 11, verse number 20, as uh, near the end of this lamentation where be Jesus begins to warn them of the ultimate consequences of their rejection. So let's read in Matthew 11 and verse number 20. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were, uh, were done because they did not, what's the next word? They did not what? Join the church, pray a prayer, accept Jesus as their uh, personal savior? No, none of those things that we often hear today that supposedly God wants people to do that because they did not repent. That's what Jesus preached. That's what he called people to do. That's what he wanted to see. And he wanted to see the fruit of repentance, just as John the Baptist had said, bring forth fruits in keeping with your repentance. And don't say we've got Abraham as our father. God can create those from these stones. Uh, and so verse number 21 of Matthew 11, he hones in on a couple of cities. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, you may not get the subtleties of what Jesus said there. Tyre and Sidon were cities today in southern Lebanon, always outside the borders of Israel from ancient times, coastal cities um, by their own right, almost like city-states, Tyre was at one time. And uh, they, are, they were denounced at various times in ancient history by by Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and even a few of the minor prophets. God sent his judgments upon them in the form of foreign armies, the Egyptians, Alexander the Great, Nebuchadnezzar, and so forth. And it's all history now. But Jesus is saying that if those cities, those wicked cities that God repeatedly judged for their sins, and which no doubt still had a reputation you know, for their wickedness because they were in the Gentile territory amongst the Gentiles out of Israel, you know, that they would have repented unlike these Jewish cities where Jesus did incredible miracles on their behalf, which revealed that the, 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 the condition of the hearts of the Jewish people, God's covenant people, was worse off than the condition of the evil, perverse Gentiles who lived across their border and who had a centuries-long reputation as being full of perverse and wicked people. You know, Canaanites to the core. Okay, and so that's a real indictment against these two cities. And uh, Jesus then warns them, nevertheless, this is verse 22, nevertheless, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Why? Because too much is given, much is required. The more effort God makes to reach you, huh, the more he holds you accountable to be reached. Of course, God is trying to reach everyone. We sometimes wonder, well, why doesn't God make a greater effort? You know, all these people walking around in darkness. Why does he make a greater effort? How come we see, you know, times when he did miracles in certain places, but other places like Tyre and Sidon, or no miracles are being done? Well, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that uh, in some cases, God's just vindicating himself. Um, the people of Israel could always boast about their heritage. You know, they, they could look at their long history of God's dealings with them and, and, and be deceived into thinking, we've got a special place in, in the heart of God and we're the special people and, and we're the only ones. And just by virtue of the fact that we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 
We got it made in the shade. We are in with God. And so in a, an extraordinary effort to help these people who in that sense are disadvantaged. They have all of this historical uh, you know, dealing from God. Um, in order to help them to open their eyes and see they're deceived, God himself comes down in the form of Jesus and preaches to them, calls them to repent, and does miracles to verify and validate his ministry. And still, ah, still, they don't repent. And so Jesus is just lamenting how hard their hearts are. Well, in verse number 23, he repeats himself in a sense, and you, Capernaum, that was you know, his base of operations, we've just been reading miracle after miracle that Jesus did in Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Well, you know Sodom, that's Sodom and Gomorrah, which God rained fire and brimstone down upon those wicked, perverse, in the greatest sense of the word, cities, and, and, and wiped them out. And Jesus said, if they had seen the miracles that Capernaum saw, they would have all turned from their perversity and from their sin, and God would have then shown them grace and mercy, forgiving them, and the, the, the effect of it would have lasted for generations all the way up until the present time, hundreds of years later, Sodom and Gomorrah would still be here. So, you know, verse 24, nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You know, Jesus warned that hell is not the same for everybody. There are differing degrees of punishment based upon uh, God's just punishments because to whom much is given, much is required. And uh, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't have the uh, privilege and benefit that Capernaum had. God never came down there and did miracles like he did in Capernaum. And Jesus said, if, if we would have, they would have turned. So that shows your hearts in Capernaum are so hard, judgment is going to be even worse for you. Okay, be right back. Okay, welcome back. We're in Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Jesus has been lamenting his generation's rejection of John the Baptist, whom they said had a demon, and uh, their rejection of him, whom they said is a, a drunkard, a gluttonous man, a friend of the dregs of society, and so forth. And then he has warned the cities of Galilee how it's going to be more tolerable, tolerable in the day of judgment for wicked cities that God judged in the past like Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah than for those cities. And so it's a real indictment against uh, the hardness of the hearts of those people. And as I previously said to you, we like to think that miracles always will result in people having their eyes opened and so forth. But uh, historical revivals, uh, that if we take a look at them, uh, the ones that there were miracles that occurred in them, you know, yeah, sure, some people it gets their attention, but a lot of people, they just ignore it. You know, not interested at all. They've got other things to do, and they don't believe it even from afar. They're not even willing to investigate to see if it's true. They've already decided that they will not believe because they're full of unbelief, which God considers to be wicked. Why? Because unbelief is not um, intelligent, it's stupid. Unbelief is a stupidness that's based upon a willful rejection of what is obvious. Did you get that? We always look at the skept skeptical ones as, as, as if they were the intelligentsia, intelligentsia the, the, the educated, the, you know, the, the, the ones who really are, uh, you know, scrutinize everything closely and then come up with a, a logical conclusion. Oh, no, 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 no. 
People who don't believe in Jesus are not wise, they're fools. People who don't believe in Jesus are not the intelligent ones, they're the stupid ones because they are ignoring the bulk of evidence that cannot be refuted, that is undeniable, and clinging to some stupid little thing by which they can attach their unbelief and justify continuing in their unbelief. You got it? Okay? That's really what unbelief is, and that's why God considers it to be wicked. You are rejecting the bulk of the evidence because you hate God. It reveals what's in your heart. The unbelief reveals what's in your heart because God does all he can to reach you. And there are miracles going on around all of us all the time, isn't there? God is shouting at everybody all the time through creation. Now, we begin reading in Matthew 11 and verse number 25. This has been so negative up until now, all these lamentations, but Jesus now takes us out of the earthly realm into the heavenly realm to show us that even though there's something to be saddened about, this rejection, there's also something to be happy about because this ultimately fits into God's overriding plan. Verse 25, at that time Jesus said, you know, now he's praying, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. And so God has had an eternal plan. He's created people as free moral agents and then he tests them over the period of their lifetimes to see if they will be qualified to be a part of his eternal kingdom. And only those who believe and who thus repent and turn from their sins uh, are those who qualify ultimately for eternal life. And that's God's plan. That has been his plan from the beginning. And so when Jesus says, you know, you've hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, it's not that God has actively said, oh, you're wise and intelligent, so I'm going to withhold this from you. No, the message is automatically, as it were, hidden from them because they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Really, it's, it's not hidden from God's standpoint, it's hidden from their own standpoint because they close their eyes and shut their hearts. They say, I'm wise, I'm intelligent, and therefore I don't believe in such simple things as this. But the, the, the infants, the babes, as the King James says, those are the ones who are soft-hearted and who are really the truly intelligent ones and the truly wise ones because they don't resist what is so obvious. They embrace it, live up to it, repent, and say, this is the way that I will go. And this same principle is said in other ways in Scripture, isn't it? Sure. The Bible says God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Well, if you're going to, you know, kind of draw a parallel between what we just read and that statement in the Word of God, the proud would be the wise and intelligent, whereas the humble would be the infants. And that, as Jesus said, was pleasing in God's sight. Now, this next verse, oftentimes, like so many verses are, is taken out of its context for certain people as a proof text to prove what, you know, something that they're uh, trying to persuade us of, yet they ignore the context before and after and thus completely switch around the meaning, the obvious meaning of what Christ was trying to convey. In verse number 27, let's read it. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And, and nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Now here's the phrase that some people just love to hone in on. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And so they'll say, oh, see there, that, that, that proves it right there. Jesus, you, you, you don't know the Father unless the Son wills to reveal him to you. And so God, through Jesus, has willed to reveal the Father to some and not to others. Well, 
shame on you for taking a verse out of its context if that's what you're promoting, because we've just read that the people whom God has chosen are not specific individuals, but a certain kind of individual, those who are infants. And he's cho chosen not to save those who are proud, who are wise in intelligence. So yes, God does choose people. He chooses humble people. He chooses the babes. Be right back. All right, welcome back as we dive back again into Matthew chapter 11. Uh, last time we were talking about how God does choose certain people. But let us not embrace the silly idea that some subscribe to that God arbitrarily, for no reason, selects certain individuals over other certain individuals, again, for no reason. That's absurd. It makes God look like an idiot, really. Uh, Jesus told us, tells us, reveals to us who God chooses. He doesn't arbitrarily select certain individuals. He has intelligently, according to his character and purpose, chosen certain people who meet his conditions uh, because, you know, that's his eternal plan. And whom has he chosen? He has chosen those who humble themselves, who repent, and who believe in Jesus, and who bring forth fruit in keeping with their repentance. And that's something anybody can do Clearly from Scripture, anybody can do it. Jesus expected everybody in Chorazin to do it, and Bethsaida, and in Capernaum. That's why he uh, uh, denounced them, because he said, you didn't repent when you saw my miracles. You should have repented. If Tyre and Sidon, if Sodom and Gomorrah had seen the miracles, they would have repented. See, so the implication is very obvious. Anyone in Sodom and Gomorrah could have repented. It wasn't as if God arbitrarily selected for them not to repent. That's nonsense. And it wasn't as if God arbitrarily selected for the people of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum not to repent. He expected them to repent, but they didn't. Why? Is it God's fault? You know? No, of course not. It's their fault. That's why he's pointing the finger of condemnation at them at this point in time. 
So Jesus, uh, according to Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, has chosen those who are babes, and he's chosen to reject those who are wise and intelligent in their own eyes. And so for that reason, when people take Matthew 11, verse number 27, lift it out of its context and say, oh, Jesus said, uh, you know, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And so that then proves that the Son only wills to reveal the Father to some people. Or that then uh, leads us to logically conclude that those who are saved, the only reason they're saved is because Jesus willed to reveal the Father to them. That's nonsense because the verses right before it co completely contradict that idea. You cannot escape this. And if we read the verses that follow, verse number 28 of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus makes an invitation. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so the only thing that needs, uh, that, that, that is necessary is for people to, to be weary and heavy laden and for them to come to him. And he says, if you'll do that, in verse number 29, you'll find rest for your souls. Who's, it, who's the invitation extended towards? All. Come to me all. So that completely contradicts the out-of-context perversion of verse number 27, where people use it as a proof text to say that God has chosen some to be saved and others to be damned. You know, when they're talking about specific individuals, nonsense. When you're talking about uh, groups of individuals who meet qualifications, then okay, we agree with it. God has chosen to save people who repent and believe. Now, back to verse number 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. So anyone who's weary and heavy, heavy laden, you know, you qualify for what Jesus is promising here. What kind of weariness and heavy ladenness is Jesus make, uh, making reference to? The, it's found in the second half of verse 29. You will find rest for your souls. So this is a soulish weariness, a soulish heavy ladenness, and a soulish rest. Well, you know, looking at the rest of the Bible, what is Jesus talking about? You find rest for your souls. Well, how do you find rest for your souls? You know, when you come to Christ, you find rest for your soul in that the burden of guilt lifts from you because you're forgiven and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and you're a new creation. Okay, so not, not promising a physical rest here. Yeah, boy, I've found some days when I'm physically tired since I came to Christ, okay? But in a large way, that overriding burden of guilt that I used to carry on, you know, in my soul, in my heart, in my mind for all those years, that has lifted because I've turned from my sins, and this is true from every, for every person who's also believed in Christ, truly believed in Christ. You've turned from your sins. You're on the narrow way that leads to eternal life, the path of righteousness and holiness. And it's a lovely, lovely feeling. We ought to remember that as we uh, look at people who are unsaved, that they are carrying a load of guilt around in their souls. And I'm so sorry when I hear the gospel being preached and people say, you can find peace, but they're not talking about this kind of biblical peace, peace and rest from that burden of guilt and sin. They're talking about just kind of peace in a very troubled world when there are wars and rumors of wars and prices are going up. But you can find peace with God because you can find a relationship with him. Well, that there's truth in that. Yet that's not really biblical truth. That's not what Jesus was talking about here. You know, when we find peace, peace, it's primarily that the foremost peace that we find through Jesus is peace with God. Because prior to our conversion, prior to our repentance, we are enemies with him. We're enemies against him, and he is you know, against us as well. Obviously, he's holding out our sins against us, and we are destined to spend, you know, to, to perish in hell. Right? So that's the kind of peace that Jesus is talking about here. It's a rest for your souls. But it is only found by certain people who do a certain thing. And uh, they have to fundamentally come to Jesus. And secondly, they have to take his yoke upon themselves and learn from him. Well, I'm here to tell you, that's been 
misinterpreted for years. And next time, we're gonna look at that and see what it really means. See you then.